what I want to concentrate on uh, this morning is uh, um, something that uh, we all learned from um, Murray Rothbard in his work on the origin of the Federal Reserve, where he showed that Federal Reserve policy is, um, is uh, driven actually by uh, politics. It's driven by the interest of the federal government and the interest of the banking elite. And because of this, uh, it, it would have been and was in historically opposed, right, by the general public, which required this uh, apparatus of um, government, or, or excuse me, of uh, economists, professional economists, to provide something like a scientific veneer to a mask, right, to cover what was actually being done uh, to generate uh, sufficient uh, uh, public uh, acceptance of of, uh, of the monster that we call the Federal Reserve. <clears throat> so I would like to uh, discuss in my talk then the most recent attempt by professional economists to provide this, this sort of veneer, this uh, scientific veneer that, over, that covers over uh, Fed policy that is still, as we know, and have experienced since uh, the financial crisis of 2007, driven by, by politics. It's driven by the interest of the federal government and, uh, and the banking elite. And this is uh, uh, embodied in this hunt for the uh, neutral rate of interest. And uh, this is monetary policy in accordance with the Taylor rule. And you can see the equation for the Taylor rule on the slide uh, and the meaning of the symbols. So the little i is the target rate for the federal funds uh, rate that the Fed sets, right? <clears throat> R star is the neutral rate of interest, which we'll get to here in a minute. Um, the, the sign for, uh, for pi is the price inflation rate. Uh, pi star is the target that the Fed has for the rate of inflation, the 2% inflation target. Y refers to uh, real output, and Y star is potential real output, what the economy would produce if it were at uh, full employment. And you can see that this, um, this policy uh, uh, equation or this policy uh, model, if you will, if the Fed were to meet its dual mandate and create the perfect balance between stable prices, which is 2% price inflation, and, uh, and uh, full, full employment uh, production, then the two parenthetical uh, uh, figures in the, in the equation would, of course, be zero, which means that their target would be equal to the neutral rate of interest, R star, adjusted for price inflation. So you can see how crucial the neutral rate of interest, getting a, an estimate of the neutral rate of interest is to the science, allegedly, that they're doing when they come up with the, um, with the target for the Fed funds rate. Now, where does this idea come from? Well, this idea comes from, the idea of the neutral rate comes from uh, Wixell. And this is what Wixell wrote in his book, Interest in Prices. There's a certain rate of interest on loans which is neutral in respect to commodity prices and tends neither to raise nor lower them. This is necessarily the same rate of interest which would be determined by supply and demand if no use were made of money and all lending were affected in the form of real capital goods. It comes to much the same thing to describe it as the current value of the natural rate of interest on capital. So you can see this is a rather odd uh, uh, concept, right? He's, he's saying that if loans were in the real physical things, the capital goods, then we would see manifested in those rates th this neutral or natural rate of interest. <clears throat> uh, and his idea was, th th the connection that he made between this neutral rate and the price level was the idea that if the, if the bank interest rate, which is in money, would differ from this neutral rate, which is in real goods, then you would see movements in, in, uh, in the purchasing power of money. So for example, um, if the bank interest rate were lower than the rate of return that investors could get in investing in capital, then entrepreneurs would run, rush to the banks to borrow at the lower rate and then invest in the higher 
uh, natural rate in the market. And as they did this, the, the banks would respond by just lending more. They would just create credit and lend more in excess of uh, the pool of saving that uh, people provided with their time preference. And this would set in motion the boom. And the boom would set in motion higher prices. And then the banks would adjust to that by raising the bank rate. And so we'd move back to this equilibrium. And the opposite would happen if the bank, uh, if banks set the uh, bank rate, their monetary rate um, uh, above the, um, uh, the rate of uh, return on real goods, then entrepreneurs would not borrow, right? They'd withdraw their borrowing, and then this would lead to a bust, and then the price structure would fall, and you'd see with price deflation, the bank would adjust its interest rate, and then things would return to sort of normal. And we can see, because we, we all are cognizant of uh, Mises's Austrian business cycle theory, we can see that Wicksell's uh, analysis here is one of the threads that Mises took to weave together his uh, business cycle theory. But of course, it's, uh, his is much more realistic, where he didn't think that what we're uh, looking at or what we should look at is something like an interest return on physical goods, right? So uh, since all things trade foreign against money, you can have an interest return on investment in uh, capital structure, and you can have interest returns on uh, credit loans. But because investors will arbitrage between any difference between these two rates, right? they're connected, and so they tend to move up and down together. And this is where Mises points out that if the banks then lower the the bank interest rate through credit expansion, this will lower the rate of return on investment in real capital goods and set in motion the boom, which is unsustainable, and then uh, um, uh, you know, it comes to an end. <clears throat> so uh, Mises also pointed out that in a market economy, uh, uh, independent banks will not ha uh, be able to push any increase in uh, fiduciary media very far. And so there's a kind of natural restriction of any dislocations uh, in production that, it, that would occur in a market economy. In other words, uh, we don't need monetary policy to give us the correct interest rate. This just would naturally arise through market exchange. Uh, the interest rate would conform to people's time preferences. So that was one path that was taken in uh, economics uh, from Wixell's work. The other path, the path that we want to look at, was uh, developed by Keynes. And what Keynes uh, did was he accepted Wicksell's position that uh, the, the interest rate is always adjusting to keep the amount of money borrowed for investment equal to the amount of money that's being saved. So, so he accepted that particular point. <clears throat> but as the Keynesians would have it, if you think about the, uh, the textbook ISLM framework for Keynesianism, uh, there uh, what Keynes was arguing was that uh, the interest rate will be inversely related to investment. Again, along Wicksell's line, right? If the interest rate is high, then, then um, uh, entrepreneurs will not borrow very much or invest very much. And so aggregate demand will be lower. And so income will be lower. And if income's lower, saving will be lower. And they'll equate again at this, at this uh, uh, under full employment uh, equilibrium. <clears throat> so this, was, uh, th this is how Keynes uh, took this. Now, given that, what, what's happened in the uh, uh, current situation is the insertion of this notion of what, again, is called the neutral rate of interest. And I know on the slide it says natural rate of interest, but for my talk, I'm going to use just the term neutral rate of interest for the, for the targeting, even though some of the slides still say natural. Uh, I couldn't correct that <laughs> on the slide. Oh, well. <laughs> so so you, can see, you can see their, their uh, thinking, right? So, so the Keynesian approach to this would say any, any point along the, along the IS curve that correlates uh, real interest rates with output, GDP, would, would be a Wixillian uh, investment is equal to saving point. And the banks could, if it were just left to the banks, they could set any, any interest rate along the IS curve. And you might end up then with a less than full employment or less than potential GDP um, outcome. 
So it's up to the Federal Reserve to set the neutral rate of interest or on the diagram, the natural rate of interest at the right spot so that it hits the IS curve at this estimate of what potential uh, GDP happens to be. So now the next question is, well, <clears throat> potential GDP is not observable. Uh, neither is the neutral rate of interest. These are not, you can't get empirical data on these, on these concepts, right? So what do we do? <clears throat> well, this is a quote from two Fed economists who uh, work in this field, uh, Laubach and Williams. And what they said in their uh, 2016 article is, we operationalize this notion that is of the neutral rate by defining the neutral rate as the real short-term interest rate consistent with the economy operating at its full potential once transitory shocks to aggregate supply and demand have abated. So they've got this more dynamic notion that you've got a trend of uh, potential GDP over time, and then you've got this cyclical variation, you know, booms and busts that move around the trend. And they're trying to parse this out by locating where you know, full employment uh, output trends happen to go. <clears throat> uh, so the next step is, well, how then do they actually operationalize this? What uh, kind of a model do they have to, to give us an estimate of potential GDP? And the, the way in which they do this is uh, they construct first a very simple model. It's just a straight linear association between the neutral rate of interest and potential GDP, just like in the previous slide, right? They want to estimate potential GDP, and then they'll know what the interest rate is along the IS curve. They just estimate these things, right, with their model. <clears throat> and the model uh, has a parameter uh, value that they adapt in order to uh, uh, take into account their actual estimates of uh, real uh, data. <clears throat> and, then, um, and then a stochastic variable, which, which gives them the variability that they can't predict over the cycle. So it's a very simple uh, arrangement. It's just kind of a correspondence directly between the neutral rate and potential GDP, again, just as we looked at in the last slide. <clears throat> uh, now, here's the, here's the technical part. The technical part is how do they estimate potential GDP? Right? That, that's the difficult thing, right? And they do this in what's called, using what's called a Kalman filter. And to give you a simple example of how a Kalman filter works, it's something like this. Suppose we have uh, an enemy uh, a group that's shooting missiles into our territory. And we have an anti-ballistic missile system that tries to shoot them down in flight. Uh, a Kalman filter will do the following in, in a scenario like that. The missile is shot. You have a radar, a pinpoint radar that hits the missile and gives you a, an exact location. And then you do this again as the missile's moving. You hit it again. And now you can calculate its velocity, right? And then you just continue to, to do this <clears throat> you know, over time. And you get, you get a, a, a predictive uh, trend line. You can see like potential GDP, you get a, a, a trend line. And then, and then in the next iteration, you don't, you don't predict it, you shoot your anti-ballistic missile. And you hope to hit it, right? Because you've estimated where that missile that's incoming will, will actually be located exactly in space. So this is the idea of a Kalman filter. Now, now as I pointed out, uh, uh, hopefully emphasized sufficiently, the Kalman filter process seems to me to be completely inapplicable in this case of um, potential GDP, because the only thing that you can actually measure in GDP is real GDP. The only data you have is the actual GDP, right? You don't, you're, you don't know what potential GDP is. And so there are all these um, processes that, uh, that uh, Laubach and Williams try to use in order to come up with an estimate of potential GDP. But you see this is completely unlike the Kalman filter 
use in real objects that are moving in, in space time where you're actually measuring the thing that you're trying to predict. Yeah, okay. So this is what, uh, this is what um, Lovick and Williams came up with. This again is just a chart of the estimates that they made in their 2016 article. And you can see the red line is the standard model. This is their simple model that they used to do the estimate. And again, this is the estimate of the neutral rate of interest that the Fed then should target if, if, they're, if they're hitting perfectly their dual mandate, right, as we showed in the, in, in the beginning. And then there's an alternative. The green is the alternative long run uh, estimate of R star, the neutral rate of interest, where it's more smoothed out, right? And you could see the, the, uh, the, the long-term trajectory then that your, uh, a, a, that your policy is aiming to hit. And then you can see the blue line is the short run. So the short run has this tremendous variation because of the uh, cyclical movement of price inflation rates and uh, real GDP movements, right? They go up and down over the cycle and so on. And that's all smoothed out in these, uh, in these alternatives, the red uh, and, and the green uh, estimates. So that's one way in which the uh, estimates are made. Now, another way to make estimates that's common in the literature, another scientific, allegedly scientific way to do these estimates is to just forget modeling altogether. And what you do in this approach called time varying parameter vector autoregression estimates, <laughs> you, can see, you can see how the math goes on, right, in the economists. Here, here, here you just simply, you, you simply um, regress, you take a regress, regression uh, estimate of lagged values of the same data that you're trying to estimate, right? So you have a path of real GDP and you just, you just take lag, you just predict the next one by looking at lagged estimates of where it's gone. There's no modeling here at all. You're just, it's purely uh, empirical. <clears throat> and then you do this, uh, in, in this particular case, you have to do this with real GDP, with uh, rates of price inflation, and with, uh, and with um, uh, real interest rates. So these are the three variables that you track in this process. And when you do this, you come up with this estimate. So this estimate is the dark line in the middle. That's the estimate using the TVP VAR uh, technique. And you can see it at first in the data set, but when you run back to the 60s and 70s, it doesn't track very well with the, with the LW estimate. But then it starts to track pretty good once you get into the mid 80s. They, they tend to run pretty close together, right? Now the interesting thing about this is, the, is actually the lighter uh, uh, lines above and below those lighter lines are the 90% confidence interval for the estimate. So is this science? I, uh, I don't know. I, you know exactly where should we, you know, how confident are we that we're coming in this, you know, average that we get between the, these rather large confidence intervals that don't tend to sort of shrink over time, right? They seem pretty, pretty constant. This seems more like um, ju human judgment to me than, uh, than uh, science. <clears throat> now, the reason for the confidence intervals being so large is this is what the actual, the green, the light green is the actual exante real interest rate. That, that's how much it moves over time. And again, the red is just the original LW estimate of the neutral rate, which is... Uh, <laughs> You know, okay, well, uh, you know, what exactly are we, how exactly accurate is this? Are we really going to set rates, you know, according to the red line, hoping that uh, this is sort of going to work out? Uh, it doesn't seem, again, uh, so much like science. Now, let me deal with one other. So I've uh, dealt with one criticism of this LW approach. Uh, let me deal with the other one, which has to do with the data itself. So remember, the first criticism is um, the, the Kalman filter approach to the neutral rate of interest doesn't actually use real data. It, it's, it's trying to estimate something that we don't know 
that we're using the model to estimate. So it's not, it's not even like the missile case, measuring the actual position of the missile, uh, the missile as it moves through space time, right? So how applicable is, uh, is the Kalman filter technique? But the other problem has to do with the data itself, right? How good is the data that we have in measuring potential output? How good is the data that we have in real GDP? We know, again, all the way back to uh, Mises' book on the theory of money and credit, we know that uh, uh, there is no such thing as a scientific price index. So this was one of the main, you know, important arguments that Mises made in the book. We can come up with all sorts of different uh, configurations of goods to put in our price index measure. And, uh, and, and in no case can we say that one of these is objectively correct and another is objectively wrong, right? So we have all sorts of options. We have the CPI, we have the PCE, we've got the uh, core versions of these, right? In uh, Lubbock and Williams, they use the PCE and then they take out fuel and food or, you know, it's all, okay. So again, how scientific is this? And, and the, the price index is used not only to, for the measure of price inflation, but for the calculation of real GDP. We have the same issue with GDP. GDP is not the only measure of output. Uh, Mark Skousen touts the uh, gross output measure, right? That's a legitimate measure of output. Uh, Murray Rothbard uh, uh, gave us the private product remaining measure of output. Why should we lump in government expenditures with private expenditures? What, are we really, it's apples and oranges, isn't it, that we're putting together since there's no economic calculation involved in government expenditures that we're lumping in. Is that really relevant to Fed policy that's supposed to be, supposed to be giving us this uh, perfect uh, dual mandate world of you know, stable prices and full employment? Um, uh, what, about, what about employment? As Ryan McMakin has, uh, has shown us uh, over and over again, the unemployment and employment figures are eh, is it really accurate. They're being revised you know, every uh, couple months and almost always downward, it seems, in our world. And so uh, are, the, are LW using just the initial figures? Are they using the revised, right? You've got this mess uh, with respect to, uh, to the data itself. Obviously, with the neutral rate of interest uh, in, the, in the Wixellian sense, we obviously cannot actually measure the neutral rate of interest, right? because it's in real terms. So we don't, we don't have direct uh, data of this uh, at all. <clears throat> and so what we're left with, of course, is this uh, veneer of science where it frees the Federal Reserve officials to pursue their real interest which is to benefit uh, the federal government uh, politicians in their um, fiscal excesses and to uh, advance the uh, material interest of uh, the banking elite. So I say, end the Fed. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.